This show is sponsored by Horizon HVAC, who you can count on for all of your heating and cooling needs. Today's episode is brought to you by Burns Roofing, your trusted roofing experts right here in Rhode Island. Whether you're in need of repairs, a roof full replacement, or just some professional advice, Burns Roofing has you covered. With their years of experience and commitment to quality, you can rest easy knowing your home is in good hands. Call Burns Roofing for all your roofing needs. Listen, first of all, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Yeah. We got Brendan Canola in studio. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, I, I want to jump into the, your earlier years and how you started. How I first got to know you was back in the club scene. Okay. Um, we never got to meet. Um, I was kind of in and out and doing my own thing. So I wasn't really, like, uh, networking wasn't a priority for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't even really think about networking like that. My priority was like girls and getting fucked up and just like <laughs> that. I, I didn't care about the other stuff. It what, was going the, around back the, in those the, days. Yeah. <laughs> the important stuff that I could have utilized today just wasn't, uh, yeah. So, um, but I've always seen you in the nightclub scene. Christina Aguay says hello, by the way. I was speaking with her last night. Um, she's that's coming funny. over, what, Sunday for dinner? Yep. And um, yeah, I want I want to start off with what got you into the nightlife scene um, and how that kind of morphed into where you are today. Funny, uh, like all good stories, it started with a girl. <laughs> I had actually broken up with my high school sweetheart and um, I was 18. Yet I was working in a, a restaurant, just learning how to bartend. And I decided uh, I needed some extra money with all the free time. I, I, I wanted to go out and have fun, but I was kind of cheap and frugal at the same time. And I go, you know what? My dad grew up and my dad worked in bars and nightclubs. His younger brother, my uncle, these guys were like, like Thor and Iron Man to me growing up. They yeah, were the yeah, greatest. Yeah. And they did it. And it was a minute. My father always told me, Brent, it's the best part-time job in the world. The worst full-time job. Mm -hmm. I was a defiant little shit. So um, I did the corporate world early, like um, you know, Irish Catholic. You you don't have days off. You work. What and was you, your first job? Like before before you got into the night all before all this stuff. I started at a uh, at KJ Pool and Spa on Reservoir Ave in Cranston. My stepfather put me to work. We had a big above ground pool in our yard, and we were always complaining. Well, why don't we ever put you know undo the pool? You know, be great. And he goes because it's expensive. You know what? <laughs> If you go get a job up the street at the pool store and you get me that discount, I'll open up the pool. I was like, let's do it. All right. So I started. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I was the worst stock boy in the history <laughs> of the world. And I loved every second of it. But then I, I, I started to learn. I had a great manager at the time. He was like the, the son-in-law of the owner. And, he, you know, you start to learn things. You learn there are guys that are willing to, to give you that ladder to show you a couple of steps. Now, I was playing football at the time. I was, uh, you know, in the heat of the summer, ruining every pair of shorts I got, dripping with chlorine. It was it was something. You, you get to learn the bug. This is high school? This is high school. Then from there, my buddies were working in the, at Bugaboo Creek, mm. the old talking buffalo, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. talking moose restaurant. <laughs> and I'll tell you what. Nobody, Jefferson Boulevard, right? Jefferson Boulevard, yeah. JB1 is the first one. Yeah. Nobody can throw dirt on that restaurant's name in front of me because I worked in a lot of spots. I've been there. It was clean. It was well run, except for the management sometimes. And that's one of my, one that of the, was the first uh, building on, on Jefferson. That was one Jefferson Boulevard. That was one that was in as in store number one. Okay. It wasn't the address. It wasn't one. one. I think I, 1400 Jefferson Boulevard, if I'm not correct. Yeah, something like something that. Something You're like right. That. Yeah, because I used to meet somebody in that parking lot for work. Um, and I remember that address. It was 1400. Oh, it was a good one. And then you had the Bickfords, which was the, the late night spot after you went out and partied. You go get pancakes at like three in the morning. And that that's a whole saga yeah. of my life, too. <laughs> but you, you start. That's where I kind of got the bug, you know, staying out late, working in bars and stuff like that. I started yeah. as a bar back. Um, work all your way up to uh, a, an expo, putting the plates together, making sure they were correct before they went out. I got really good at that. And from there, it was, I was still young. I was probably 17. You couldn't become a waiter until you were 18. They were itching for me to become a waiter. 
they didn't, they, they wished. I don't think they got what they wanted because I was a mounty little shit. And if I thought you were doing something wrong or it's just my mentality. Yeah. I want things to be correct. I want things to get done. Even, right. even at an early age like that. Because I knew that I was being monetized and penalized if it wasn't. Mm. So like if it was out of my control, you know, if the cook screwed something up, I'm out of tip. I didn't like that. So for more control, I decided to work my ass off a little bit harder and I became a bartender and I wasn't the world's greatest bartender, but I was the best time. Yeah. And I ended up realizing I can do something else at night if I'm doing this. So I took every day shift and I worked my ass off and I had the busiest lunch shift ever on the smoking side because that's where the bar was back in the day. You could still smoke. And I used to always get really, really, really razzed up when people would bring their kids on the smoking side. But we had the ability to push a button and the moose would talk. But at the behest of your kid listening and inhaling secondhand smoke, it always kind of bugged me out. That's also the reason why I left Providence College to become a teacher, because I realized that was everybody in my family is a teacher, except for my father, my grandfather, and myself. But I realized that discipline was going to be a thing. Kids weren't telling their kid not to draw all over the, uh, yeah. the tablecloths. I cleaned up enough soggy, wet Cheerios that people brought in in baggies to just realize these people don't care about their kids huh. acting correct. These are going to be my parent teacher conferences. Mm. And then every holiday I ever went to was my family complaining about the kids in the school, the union, the city of Providence, all this other stuff. It just led to, oh, I'm going to find something cooler to do. So did you want to go be a teacher in, in order to kind of change the direction of where um, it was going? I had an amazing fourth grade teacher who was a dude. Uh, my teacher ended up getting pregnant and took her maternity leave in like month two of school. And one of the sub teachers came in. He was a 40 year old ex college football player from Kentucky. Wow. And he, you know, my parents had split up and I was living in central Florida and like this guy realized he could make an impact on a lot of young kids lives. And he was just that dude. Yeah. He would throw the football with us at recess. You know, he'd, he'd burn his personal time to go make a mark on us. And then I just realized that there was something to be said for mentorship mm. at a young age. I realized that that was huge. And, you wow, know, that's, 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 that's incredible to actually be, you know, to, to, to notice that at a young age. I'm an observant guy. It is what it is. I figured that out because the kids that didn't have that, like we did not grow up in, uh, it, it was just the other side of the trailer park. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. We weren't, we weren't bougie. We were, you know, we were dirty little kids. My mom was a waitress and there were four of us oh, and we didn't really afford babysitters. So I, I was left alone all the time yeah. as a kid. And I had my three younger brothers who each one is a hellion worse than the next. <laughs> and there are, there will be a book written about that, that period of my life at some point. But you realize the importance of like having a, a just somebody in there to, to, to give you the guardrails. I didn't dare step out of line when I was in school because my teacher who I respected would be upset with me. And I didn't want that. I wanted to, to, you know, I, w I, I would have to sit around and do nothing while my buddies and him got to throw a ball around. And that's all we wanted to do was the coolest. Not having the ability to kind of to, to, to be on that level, it kept me out of a lot of trouble. And mm. believe me, I, I still sought out trouble in my days. Um, but you kind of always have that in the back of your head, like you got to stay on the good side of the ball. Seems like you were aware of the consequences of, of the trouble that you were getting into, though. It was um, it was, a you know, like you said, every kid gets into mischief. But at the same time, I had a couple of examples in my life where I saw the hammer come down on people and that the life lessons that I learned there were really like the guideposts yeah. that became like my tenants of life. Yeah. And again, it's one of the reasons why when I got into that nightclub lifestyle, I knew where the boundaries were. I knew, you know, that that's a hot stove. We don't touch those hot stoves. We stay away from this kind of scenario over here. Not what I'm going to, not what I'm about. I know that because people go down that road, it's a bad situation. So I stayed away from it, but I may have gone in the other direction on a couple of other things. It was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing crazy stuff like this, but I did end up in it for a while. It was, uh, imagine having 20 years of your life where you didn't have to pay a bar tab. 
Yeah. yeah. And there was. Yeah, was, you can get into a lot of trouble like that. Oh, that was. For, a, for anybody looking to get into the restaurant business or getting into the bar backing business, first job, what, what would you say to them? What recommendations would you give them? If I'm opening up a bar today or if I'm doing anything like that, if I'm put in charge of a situation, I need to see that you have to be that that Swiss Army knife person. Like the ability to say, no, okay, what else do you need? Or let me do something else. Be able to see the problem before it becomes a problem. That's it. And you know what? You can pick up on little kids that are like that right off the rip. Some Something you don't have to teach. You just tell them to get up and do it. You give them the slightest bit of direction and they're off to the races. Now, the worst thing you can ever say, you, you must know, you know this. I know you guys know this. That's not my job. I'm not doing it. Right, oh, it's right. the worst. Okay, the, that's the first. Yeah, see you later. It's like the ejector seat yep. right there. Get yep. out of my face. I don't want to hear you. Yep. Because if you're not willing to put a little bit of on, a little bit on the line, and I would never take advantage of somebody, you know what I mean? But the old uh, adage, you walk by a side stand and there's, there's dishes on it. Take them in the back. Oh, it's not my table. Okay, th that's all you ever need to tell me. That's a big indicator on like how they live their life outside as well. You know, you could tell, you could break down somebody's character by very simple traits that they, um, that they showcase in business. You know, and that's one of them. When you see certain things and somebody walks by a rag that's hanging over a table and they just leave it there and so, something like that, where it's so easy just to pick up and be a team player, like be a team player, help out, help out your business. Because if that business doesn't do good and you get a bad reputation with that business, then nobody else is going to do good. It's a, it's a, something where they, you all need to work together in order to make something happen. And when you start realizing that, you know, you can really start doing some, uh, some good stuff. That's exactly what they taught in the military too. Cause you think about it in the military, they target right out of high school. So you've got this massive group of 18, 17, 18, 19 year olds, and they teach that attention to detail, but also that's how they weed out who's going to be really good at one job or the other is by those that are walking past something, that yep. piece of trash on the ground yep. or those that are stopping to pick it up because you know what, that's part of the rules in the military, paying attention to detail. So it's amazing that you said that you picked up on that and that's how life deviates between two different types of people. And that is the secret to any success that I've ever had. I was the guy that, you know, I, it's like the ultimate uh, you see the meme all the time, the shopping cart test. Like, are you the type of guy that's just going to let it sit there and smash somebody's car? Or are you going right. to bring it back to its little corral? Half the time, I'm trying to find the guy. I'm bringing the cart over to him. Like, I'm trying to make your life easier, buddy, because you never know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I might, you know, hey, you were the guy. You, you did something. It's that it's the ultimate like like karma give back. I don't expect anything out of anybody. But because I've done so much to help other people in my career and in my life, just how I operate. People know that and you'll get it back. That's what, and, and that, that's the whole thing. Tenfold. You will. And that's, and you have, and you have, I, I, I've gotten to live a very, very interesting and cool life. Yeah. I get the, uh, <laughs> the most, the Dos Equis guy sometimes, cause I've got a story for everything. And <laughs> you know, you, the first time we met, it was, it just, it, I knew it was going to, it was clicking. We were going to have a good time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She, she hey, said that by thing. the way. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your service. I, I had no idea, but it, I saw the pictures yesterday being yeah. veterans. Day, and I'll tell you, it just absolutely makes sense. So I thank you. I appreciate it. You know what? It does it make was, sense, doesn't it? I've, oh, well, not for nothing. <laughs> Keep guy like us right. Need that. But um, I'll tell you, and not everyone can pull the green off. You did. Thank yeah. you Bravo. very much. It was my pleasure. <laughs> it gave me a sense of honor and um, for our entire country. Before that, I was just um, an American that was spoiled because we're really spoiled in our country. Um, it wasn't until joining the military, learning how to pay attention to detail and respecting our, our authority and then going to Afghanistan where I was like, OK, we have it lush here in America. So I'm grateful for that experience. And I really feel like a lot of our kids need to do at least two years in the military because of how wonderful the training. It's just basic training. It's just basic human dignity, basic everything that every a lot of people are missing. 
you see you see videos of I saw some videos on Twitter this morning, you know, after the election and <clears throat> Kamala supporters coming out and saying, I'm moving out of this country. Um, this country is terrible. I can't believe how fucked up this country is. And this is probably the worst it's ever been. And this and Sheena just says they they just they've never been outside this country. <laughs> if true. you've gone outside this country and gone to one other country. You're going to realize how easy we have it here and the opportunity that just is infectious. It's everywhere. If you want something, you can get it no matter what. If you put a little bit of hard work, elbow grease, some sweat equity, you you just get in there and just do it. You can accomplish anything you want to do. But people don't realize that they take it for granted. They go around and they think that, you know, we got it so tough. And it, it, I got no sympathy for that shit, man. None. It. It all comes down to the fact that in today's day and age, laziness is the epidemic. And believe me, I have been stricken with it many times in my life Mm -hmm. where I'm if I'm ever in a position where I'm not where I want to be. I I'm looking at myself in the mirror first. It's that that brutal self-assessment like. You know, nine times out of ten, people can't can't take the slightest bit of criticism yeah, without yeah. flying off the handle. <clears throat> I know. And no, you know, I I deal with it every day, where I can kind of you know I have been my biggest obstacle. I am the one in that mirror when I'm looking at myself and I'm being honest, and that's what nobody does anymore. You know how valuable it is to have a friend that calls you out on your shit. This is why I mm-hmm. I surround my I, I can't surround myself with sycophants. I need to surround myself with the people that still look at me like I'm a complete moron at 17 years old because I know that they're not, no matter what level of success that I attain and at any venture that I'm putting my my efforts into, they're still going to razz me. They're still, <laughs> but, you know, then as you get a little bit older and you do the kind of the things that we have done, you know, you got the, the guys, that, you know, just tell you that everything you're doing is great. It's like, no, it's not. That yeah. was the stupidest thing I've ever done. Exactly. And right. I don't need people enabling my shittier qualities. Yep. I need people to tell me, what are you doing? You, you're being an idiot. Yep. That's like, exactly what Michael was saying yesterday. He said one of his business partner friends, he said he needs somebody that's not going to be a yes man. He needs somebody that's going to tell him the truth and he's going to be straightforward with him. And that's how you progress. Mm -hmm. Because like you were saying, you can't have people that are going to stroke your ego because that the ego isn't what catapults us forward. It's, it's a little bit of both the ego, but also you got to use your brain. You got to have that honesty of yourself. Yeah. It's being able to look in the mirror and be like, all right, I may be wrong right now. How can I grow from this? Yes. There was a book that I ended up reading at 19 years old. That one of, one of the books. I'm a reader, I and um, uh, failing forward, failing forward. The gist of the book that the author escapes me at this point in time. But I had gotten my life and health insurance license at 19 years old. Nobody wanted to hear insurance from a 19 year old. I learned that John, John C. Maxwell. Maxwell. Oh, dude, yeah. he's the man. Oh man, so he's imagine, awesome. He's got a bunch of good stuff. I I graduated. So I probably read that book around 2001. I was going to an insurance training seminar in Atlanta, Georgia. I picked it up on that. Somebody recommended it to me and I picked up that book and I read it cover to cover. And at that point in my life, that I think that was like the first like, like training manual on how to get, you know, people call it self-help. I don't think it's self-help. I think it's, it's, it's investment wisdom. in self wisdom. Yeah. These are the breadcrumbs that people are leaving for us to kind of walk behind. If you come at me at any point in my life and I'm, I'm you're asking me for something and I give you a book recommendation or I tell and you're like, oh, I don't, I don't do that. I don't read bro. Audible <laughs> exists. If you yeah. can't do it, I've had concussions. YouTube, dude, YouTube, <laughs> everything, the yeah, audio yeah. book, just yeah. get the yeah. knowledge from however you want to ingest it yeah. from here to here. And that's it. Like, like 99% of my consultations, I'll give you something to do. And if you can't do it, don't come at me the second time and ask me the same question. I'm still in this position six months from now. Hey, did you do the thing I told you to do? Well, no, I can't help you. Yeah. Want to know how I learned that lesson? Cause I was that guy once. Yep. And then when I started learning the lessons and then it was like the super Mario brothers, the warp zone, like do 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 you, you're up three levels now. It's all it was. Yeah. Circling back. Nightlife was a weird thing because when I got into that business, for the first and foremost, I'll never forget it. I, I, my, re- my qualifications on my resume were I played football and I wrestled at high school. <laughs> and that was it. They called me like, when can you start? <laughs> Did you Ross, really have to have qualifications, though, in the nightlife? They, listen, they had like 
you go to like Staples, you get like the job application rip off sheet. Yeah. And you know, you don't know. And you wing I'm, it. I'm, I'm 18 <laughs> years old. I, I, I was Mardi Gras in Cranston. Oh God. I got oh, a crazy man. story about that place. Listen, <laughs> that Dude, place I got turned, a crazy story about that place. Turned a boy into a man. <laughs> Let me tell you. Real quick. Oh, I, I was, you know, I had just come off. I, I, unfortunately my athletic prowess, my family said, you're not going to play football. <laughs> you're not going to wrestle in college. So why don't you go somewhere, you know, you can, you can go to PC. Why don't you do that and, and try to use your education, get an education a little bit more because I'm unfortunately the Cranston public high school, uh, Cranston high school East public system looked at me when I was in high school and said, Oh, you should probably just go to the military. Oh. Yeah. That was my, my thing too. Everybody, my everybody my guidance counselor was 97 years old. Wow. He's the nicest man in the world. <laughs> He Jesus. looks like the little, <laughs> you, do you remember the Adam Sandler cartoon movie, Eight Crazy Nights? Yes. He was the little old man in that movie. He literally wow. was 97 and he was he still working? Was, he was, you know what? He was Mr. Centauri. His son ended up becoming- Sounds the, old. He, he was old. <laughs> he had the Coke bot, like the old glasses, <laughs> nicest man in the world. But I think maybe, you know, we could have put him out to pasture a few years before that. <laughs> Because I am nobody pushed me to ever look to into any matriculating program to go to school. Yeah. And I, I look at it like, well, I, I it might have been lost on me, but it was never an option that I really took seriously because I thought it was stupid to go pay for a bunch of classes I wasn't going to be interested in. And I saw way too many people waste the college degree. I was in the bar business and, you know, everybody was like, well, I got a college to do this. What are you reading? Ask some stupid thing on this that I'm never going to. I'm like, how is that going to make Charlotte's you money? Charlotte's Web. Oh, my God. Charlotte's Web's a legit book. I will I say that. I love Charlotte's Web. That Don't is doubt some it. Some pig. Right there. Some pig. So what was your first nightclub that you were a part of that you really were like, all right, this is what I want to do? Day one, minute one, second one. When the lights come on at Mardi Gras, I'm 18 years old, and there's just a there's an electricity. No, there was here. that place was that place was crazy. Well, just when people want to have a good time, when everybody's energy in the room is, I want to just have. I've had a I've had a week, and I want to go out. And I want to enjoy my people. There's something to be said about being part of that environment. That's cool. Now you get a turd in the punch bowl every now and then, yeah. and then that was it. I was a bouncer. Yeah, and I learned from an old school guy. He was probably in his sixties at the time, but they stuck all the young guys and we learned from Walter and Walter was a character, but you learned his biggest pet peeve, taking your shoes off on the dance floor. If you were walking around with you, you used to at say Mardi Gras at Mardi Gras. He hated that. And then I took that with me and you, you Brennan would yell at me because I had my shoes off. I'm like, yeah, because I'm going to tell you a little story. Is that a, is that a um, an insurance thing? Like a, uh, it's an everything thing. It's gross. Tell you, Why would you walk around? Because, <laughs> yeah. well, beauty is pain. And there, there is something <laughs> true, to be said true. about the ones that can keep their shoes on. True. But we're all walking around. You know what happens in what bodily fluids yeah, that's what must I'm be abound in any nightclub. <laughs> oh. And then and then mix that broken glass. Yeah, mix yeah. that with, you know, all sorts of you're going to get like gonorrhea of the feet yeah. <laughs> yeah. and like your feet are going to fall off. You're going to get club foot. <laughs> this is what he Literally used to tell me. I, I'm, I'm verbatim Walter right now. And at, at 18 years old, I'm 42 now, but 43 in a couple of months. It still rings into my head. And it was just a thing like you don't want to. You know what? Don't go home with any of these. Don't go home. He was just old cigar chomping guy. He had like the Johnny Unitas, oh, like nice. old school flat top <laughs> yeah, buzz cut, yeah. haircut. Probably all of five, six, the guy was like a living Wolverine. Yeah. Like yeah. you don't go, Walter will get you. So you, you learn. And then, you know, you, you learn the other side of the, you know, the the nightclub businesses. You know, I, I saw Roadhouse a few too many times when I was a kid, but the mentality, be nice. Yeah. Be nice till you don't have to be nice or until somebody forces you to not be. But I'd rather sit there and tell somebody that your buddy is drunk. Yeah. And before something bad happens, why don't you take him home? And when next time you come to see me, I'm going to shake your hand. I am going to walk you in front of this entire line of people. And I'm going to treat you like you're a goddamn king because you made my life easy. And I didn't have to get blood on my shirt tonight for whatever reason. I worked at some places 
you needed to make sure you had a stain stick in your car because you were going to go home with somebody else's DNA on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not fun for anybody. What year was this? Tough love. Let's see. I Probably 01. I started at the... I was done with the restaurants completely by like 01. I started into the, the nightclub scene right around that time. And then from there, I, I you know, after Mardi Gras for a couple of years, I bounced around to a couple of other places. I did some uh, some touring band security. I did a little bit of the bodyguard work. And then lo and behold, I find myself at the complex. The complex. The complex. So, so okay, so this sounds like it's around 2006, six seven. Probably, like that. yeah. So Ed Brady goes to California. Oh, that guy. He's okay. the greatest. <laughs> goes out to California and he comes back. Shout out to Ed Brady, by the way. Absolutely love Ed Brady. The Everything goat. that he's doing. He is the GOAT. He's incredible. Um, he goes out to California. He comes back. What did you learn? from Ed Brady, uh, what did he bring back with him to the nightclub scene? So when Ed came back to the scene, he, you know, he started with a couple of smaller venues and he ends up getting the, the crown jewel in Providence. He's working at The View, right across the street from Providence Place Mall. He's working with the the, the best people in in doing it, his, his, uh, his 401 group that he started. He had the creme de la creme because he saw what they were doing West Coast side. And he brought that mentality here. Then you start to see the smartest, to be honest, the best marketing I've ever seen, and all credit to, he hired a photographer and he branded photos. And it was a who's who anytime. This was a my 401 space time, picture would pop up. A 401 picture would pop up. You would see good looking people having a good time. And you're wondering, how come I'm not in that picture? Mm. What do I do to get in that picture? Some of my best friends are working with him very, very, very tight at the time. Bouncers, bartenders, things like that. And sooner or later, um, you know, the, the complex came and went and I lucked into a position because I had worked at the complex when the Coliseum was first opening. Um, I went to the, uh, it, was, it was a Craigslist position. Craigslist. I, had, I had done... <laughs> Um, I was in corporate America for a little while and doing nightlife stuff on the low end, um, at night. Cause I was always, I would always hustle. I, the best thing I ever did in my life was work more than one job Yeah, because it, a, it kept me out of trouble. Idle hands are the devil's play thing. Oh yeah. And oh, yeah. That the truth? I always wanted money to do, do cool stuff. So in doing that, you, you end up, uh, I just, Hey, by the way, um, you're, you're staffing for this place. I've worked here before. I know every inch of this building. So, I mean, at worst case scenario, you should probably give me a job. And they did. And then what happens there is um, I lucked into three owners who gave a shit. And in the nightclub business, there were guys that are just, they'll call it a paint and pray. They'll take over a spot. They'll throw a paint job on it. And they'll work They did it. that with a few spots on the hill. <laughs> I won't yep. talk about the hill in any way, shape, or form at any point during this podcast. But um, these guys were out to do something different. The two salon owners from North Providence and, um, and a general contractor with an art degree from RISD. And these three guys gave me over the, you know, and I earned my spot because there was a disconnect in the beginning between the security team who were old school bouncers and this management team that I've never really run on the large scale nightclub. They had run a couple of bars together and they were successful, but it's a different animal. That's one of the biggest rooms in Rhode Island. So to really make that place big, you needed um, a, a bit of a go between to get everybody on the same page. And I would listen to these guys in the back, just bitch, 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 bitch. But then like, Hey, you know, anybody want to talk about anything? You know, just these guys were trying to bridge that gap. I just started to say, Hey, all the guys are concerned about this. And then uh, lo and behold, I became like the, the de facto like union boss <laughs> for the bouncers because guys, we're never going to get anything right. These guys want to help us. But if you just sit there and complain all day long and behind back and never do anything about it, nothing's going. What's some change. of the stuff that they would complain about? Some guys were like, uh, you know what? They're old school. I want to get paid cash at the end of the night. Uh, uh, like just. Yeah. stupid dumb stuff where these guys are trying to do a legitimate business and in doing so some of the guys were complaining oh, i'm not getting enough hours i'm not doing this i'm not doing that and i was just i was hearing both sides of the ball i'm like i'll just be the the, the go-between the voice of these guys and then 
you showed a little bit more initiative. I wasn't getting paid anymore. Right. But okay, that eventually led me to the point where they they gave me um an assistant manager position. And I was then I was the head of Who's this? This is View. This is not the View. I the View ended up after I kind of made my I was still an unknown. Nobody knew who I was at this time. I was just a regular guy. I was uh, the bouncer and the, down at the end of the stairs until somebody realized they came in the, the Coliseum their first couple of months. They hadn't hit their stride yet. They brought in new management. It was some of the guys that came over from the view at the at the time. And they took one look at me and they go, this kid doesn't shut up. We should put him out in front of the building with a suit and a clipboard. And he's our new VIP guy. Nice. Ooh, good and move. then it was like, okay, my, my, I needed to make sure that the right people got in and the right people didn't. One of my best friends, um, he was, uh, he was a cop. And he was also, he did some time running, you know, security teams. And I learned from these guys and they brought in an actual VIP host. And I learned from them how they did it at other more successful places. And I'll, 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 I'll take on something to do. And then that's it. They gave me a lot of responsibility and I, I took everything I could and like, what else do you have? I'll, I'll take more on. And uh, sooner or later, uh, th this is, I got jumped in. There was one night we were all partying. It was at the end of the night and Rhode Island legend Vinny Pazienza is in the building. <laughs> and um, Vinny at the time had a couple of drinks and he wasn't going to drive home. So I figured one of the guys that I was with, they were buddies. They'd known the guy. I'm just, I'm just a, a little guy. Or as one of my, my old mentors used to say, I'm big shit, you little shit. Yeah. And one day <laughs> you be big shit. Today, you know, big shit. <laughs> R.I.P. Mr. Kim. Mr. Kim taught me a lot back in the day. But I was, I was a little shit in that time. It's freezing out. And it was time to, you know, take Vinny out. And he's inebriated beyond belief. And I look around and I'm like, oh, so who's taking Vinny home? And I'll never forget this. I look and the guys are sitting in the car with the heat on and the light on. They look at me, they point, and they go, bye bye. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, holy shit, I have to take home five-time world champion boxer Vinny Pazienza, who's got to get home safe because in my little Saturn SL1 on a black ice sleet crazy night, you know, I'm not going to end up on the front page of the Providence Journal. Yeah. So I'm sitting there, and I got to tell you, Vinny has been the sweetest guy to me. I, I, I love seeing him. He's, he's quite the character. They made the movie about him. I just, I had to get him home safe. So I, you know... Being in the scene a little while, I knew where he lived. He was dating somebody that um, we would see publicly all the time. And we knew where she lived. So we were going to just, okay, I, I know where to take you. So I, I kind of nudged him and he's, he's, and he's passing out in my seat. And I swear to God, this is a true story. He's shadow boxing as he's sleeping. Like the level <laughs> it takes to get a guy to be a world champion. And I mean, watch some old Vinny Pazienza footage. The kid was a maniac. Oh, yeah, yeah. But like, and I'll never forget, he really liked the song, the Black Eyed Peas song. Tonight's gonna, he's singing that while he's shadow boxing in his sleep and passing out every two seconds in my car. <laughs> like, this is the wildest story of all time. <laughs> so long story short, I take him down to, uh, to Warwick. I nudge him. I'm like, hey, Vinny, we're at Villa Del Rio. So, and this is, and, Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're here. We're here. I go, which building is it, buddy? I want to make sure you get in. Directs me to the building. Drop Vinny Paz off. Okay. Next morning, that was a Friday night. I'm there the Saturday. So get the champ home okay? I go, yeah, yeah. No, 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 nothing. Would you take him? I go, oh, to his place at Villa Del Rio. He goes, Vinny doesn't live in Villa Del Rio. He lives in Coesed Hills. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. And was I, did anybody live there <laughs> did, did, hey the doorman let him right in all right and good. He, listen you good. Had, those days you weren't telling Vinny anything yeah, other good than, enough yes i'm telling <laughs> good you. enough but that was it and i mean that that was once that story kind of got out it was like oh yeah brent's cool yeah, yeah he, you did what you had to do you and, got it and, done and, and you know what i every time i see him like, hey, Vinny, you stayed in villa del rio he laughs, you know, he's, he's, he's still a character. That's funny, man. So you ended up starting a bouncing company during this entire time. I ended up helping a couple of, I was always a secret weapon mm -hmm. because randomly I got really good at IDs 
And this was a time when they were cracking down. Managing like fake IDs, being able to tell the difference between a fake ID. Did they get really good to a point where you couldn't tell? No, they never did. No? That was the best thing of all time. And I, I've got a really good bullshit detector too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't so much because the fake ones were just egregious. The real talent came into, you've got a sister and you look like your sister. She's a year and a half older than you. But I went the extra step and I learned how to to really really crack down on like facial recognition mm. and i can read your body language i can read your tone and coliseum at that point in time was in the heart of college district downtown providence um i would do all the introduction i was the mc nice. on top of running you know a couple of other pieces i didn't do you're it all myself ladder, so what kind of money were you making? You're what up. kind of money were you making at this time oh i mean it's not cool to talk about um, I was, I would say that I was doing pretty solid at that time in my life. Um, you know, I, I promoted but were events. You, were you just making most of your money off of just like hourly rate or were you, were you able to kind of like figure no, out how to make I learned money from different ways? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there different it ways. Is. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I had the ear of a couple of really, really, really smart guys at the time. Good. And, um, you know, they kind of see, uh, saw at that point what I was capable of doing, and I learned, and I had sales in my back pocket. Yeah. So not only that, I was selling VIP tables and I was uh, learning how to work people. And this is, you know, every sales acumen that I ever had, this was the, the, the ground for it. I learned where to push, where to pull, where to kind of read a situation for somebody where other people would maybe just throw somebody out. I'd give them a chance. If you showed me that you were worth taking a chance on, I would give you a chance. If you were a shithead, then you were going to burn a bridge with me. And I was the most vindictive piece of shit. And this is the history of downtown Providence. But if you were on the team, because my goal at the end of the night was to make sure my owners were happy. Everybody that walked in, the, you know, said this was like 08, 09, 2010. We would just come out of a recession. And I mean, this is where I first started to look into real estate. But the country had just imploded yeah oh eight oh nine yeah it was oh, a tough time it was, it was brutal yeah so discretionary income was something that you know not everybody had mm -hmm. and the people that were out there building and, and doing stuff and, and and trying to get their head on straight and to be honest i was you know in my late 20s into my 30s at the time and i had a, just a couple of people saw what that i was capable and they were looking for somebody to fill a hole because they couldn't do it themselves. Meaning in another business outside of the club scene? More so like the management couldn't, you have 9,000 things that you need to do before you turn the lights on and you start your night. And then you're hoping that you're busy enough to cover everything and, and get everybody paid and do what you got to do. And because these guys were so good, shout out to, to Anthony, Eric, and Darren from Coliseum. They had run successful businesses. They just hadn't run the largest per square foot nightclub in the city of Providence. So they had to scale up all of their operations. And you can't just do that as three people. So you need to be able to team build for the position that you need. Yeah. You needed a guy that will never shut up. You, you, you get a Brendan. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I am not the greatest at all things. So they made sure that you gave me the pieces that I need to be successful. And sometimes it was a budget. And then this is kind of where the, the, the beginnings of being a consultant came in and in, in real estate, being able to just figure out how to get it done. Oh, you want to throw a, 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 one of the craziest things we ever did. You want to do a, a, a latex body paint fashion show. Okay. It's great on paper. How do you make that happen? We found a way to make it happen. Yeah. So talk about some of the stuff that you used to do in order to attract people to your club rather than going to view or another location. What what did you try to do to separate Coliseum or wherever you were at the time to try to separate yourself from other clubs and people going to other clubs? Like very, what was your go-to? Very to be honest, you had to have gorgeous women. 
Yeah. I mean, it's hundred percent. Maybe, That's probably, maybe yeah. it's maybe it's uncouth to say these days, but back in our back in those days, yeah, 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 yeah still yeah. like that. Yeah. Still like Sex that. Has always it's always going to be like that. You have everything. to. Why people, do you go out? Why yeah. do you go out? You go out yeah. to meet women. You go out to, you know, and just getting drunk. I think is a byproduct. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure. It's usually to go out to meet women or, or, or guys. Yeah. Then when you realize you can do it without the booze, then it's like Neo in the Matrix. Yes. <laughs> You're so right too. Man. Oh. You're so right. Yeah, yeah. But um. I learned very, very, very early on, nothing kills your night more than it being a sausage party. Yeah. And I yeah. mean, so the guys that had money wanted to be around beautiful women, <laughs> but you couldn't be a creep and you needed to vet out the creeps. So we just kind of had a very, very, very good ebb and flow where um, the women that were around trusted the fact that we weren't going to get them into any weird positions and anybody acted sideways. Um they were gone. So nice it's like, so them. for the women, it's like, okay, we're going to go to Coliseum because there's no creeps there. And for the guys, it's like, we're going to go to Coliseum because there's, there's good women there. There's, I would say that, women that is there. a very, very, very subtle. It wasn't just that too. I had built up a little bit of a, a name and a following under my infamous banner, where it was a nickname that it was given to me. I'm the infamous Brendan Phillip and anything when it comes to nightlife or entertainment reasons. And um, just because my last name was too well known and other reasons and God forbid something went sideways when it came to uh, nightlife, I didn't want my grandmother getting weird phone calls at the end of the night, you know, at, at 85 yeah, years old. Yeah. So it ended up being um, I was addicted to oh, it was it's so rednecky, but there was a full throttle saloon <laughs> and then Coyote Ugly. I loved Coyote Ugly. Were those Ugly. movies? Full throttle saloon was a. And one of the things we ended up getting to was I was part of a team that put on the Providence bike night and it was at a, a oh, I remember that. Yeah. What, what club was that? It was, that a, was um, it was originally hell, hell, uh, uh, the red room, the red room. And then it became saints and sinners. Saints and sinners. Yes, yes, yes. And they had this outdoor space underneath the highway over by yep. the civic center. Mm -hmm. And we had like an outdoor biker rally and it was lined the bikes were lined up down the street wow. up and down the street yeah, and yeah. after the first year they gave it to me solely to run i had the greatest management in the world over there like uh sean carroll and his wonderful wife becky they gave me the ability they give me a budget they needed me to deliver every wednesday night as bar barring any mal weather or rainstorms things like that we had to pack that saloon yeah and we it was it was it was an undertaking and then we had you know like a, again it's not cool to say now that we ran hot body contests yeah, I remember and that. then that's where i'm introduced to the greatest individual in my life which was my best friend leonardo tillette to uh, studios yeah. rest in peace rest in peace and uh that was the ultimate stepbrothers moment. Did we just become best friends? <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> and it was funny because I, I I pushed that meeting off for probably a good like six months. Well, like, a meeting between you two? Me, yeah, him and I. There was somebody that was trying to put us together. He goes, you know, I, I know what you're doing. Uh, it was one of my sponsors at the time. Was like, I, I know a guy. And and for what you're doing over here, he's he's got a modeling studio and a team. And I'm like, oh, you know what? Like what we would do would, you know, you bring your your gorgeous chopper and you would put them, uh, you know, front and center. And, you know, we would have beautiful women on your bike taking pictures of it. I had a pro photographer. The first guy that we did did a good job, but I knew that we could push it further. So I have this conversation. I meet I'm at the Lorraine Studios in uh, Pawtucket, Pawtucket. On Mineral Spring yeah, Avenue. Yeah, yeah. And I, I meet this short, stocky, built kid with the biggest smile i've ever met in my danny, entire danny life danny was in his studios too Gra uh, graphics guys graphics guys danny torres yep. danny was a little bit danny was a third piece of that puzzle and um we just we kind of just started clicking and it, it, without him i'm not me i give him i am i am just another what guy. are some of the biggest things that uh that he helped you with we had the ability because of his his artistic prowess um, we could, all you needed to do was write it down on a piece of paper and we would find a way to get it done. He had this, this high concept stuff, but we were able to do, I remember a Tillette photo was like very, you know, it was the beginning of Instagram models. Yeah. He was, he was the OG yeah, he, yeah. and he had learned from a couple of great guys and he brought that style to the Rhode Island area. 
And okay, I'm management at nightclubs. Every, I, I used to say all the time, the, a new celebrity is born as soon as they turn 18 in Providence every weekend. True. And what we would do was we would make sure that if you were somebody that people would want to see, I wanted you working at a bar. I wanted to make sure that nobody was going to mess with you. The bad guys would stay away and you could get work and you can do it, you know, clean and respectably. And a lot of people ended up getting um, bartending and you know, serving, go-go dancing, all of these awesome gigs. And you knew that you weren't going to get messed with and you, you avoid the casting couch. You offered protection. It was just, just you knew that. And the, there were some creepy creepy scenarios that ended up coming up yeah dude. you had the beginnings of like catfishing and people telling people that they could get them jobs and all they had to do was send compromising pictures yeah. all of this crazy stuff now we did some weird stuff back in those days <laughs> i did a black i did two black tape fashion shows one one over the course of two years two of our we would just make up an excuse to have a fashion show we would get a gaggle of like 10 or 12 girls and we would have 2,000 people show up. Wow. And some of those people ended up doing some amazing stuff. And that was all because of him. I've just, what do you need me to go and do? Yeah. Those, I'm not an artist. Those toilet pictures were legendary. And like you saw somebody that popped up with a with a post with a toilet picture. It kind of gave them of, of, of like, all right, that, that's Notoriety. a valid. Yeah, yeah. You know? Talk about some of the people that came into the nightlife that you saw have huge potential in life, but then you all of a sudden saw them going down a darker road because of the people they were hanging out with, maybe the things that they were starting to get involved in. Do you, did you see that happen a lot with people kind of taking the wrong turn? I used to call it the Facebook profile picture test. <laughs> so when you would come in, the first thing you would do, you know, you'd take up, you know, we would notice you because all of a sudden every weekend you get a whole new rash of people that wanted to, every bouncer, every bartender, everybody. We were a very inclusive group at the Coliseum and we wanted, we were encouraged to sit there and, 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 and grow our social media followings because it was all part of the marketing plan. And in doing so, in six months of somebody's life, look at how many times their profile picture changes. Mm. And there was a, my, I catch a lot of shit for this because I was never into the EDM scene. In fact, I had a 20 year career in nightlife and I hate nightclubs. It's, it's odd to say. No, I, I, I know I, what you're saying because I didn't like them either, but I was I, there. But, the, but you had to be there. I'm an old school rock and roll kid. I grew up, my mom grew up on tour buses. My, they, they followed the Grateful Dead. It was a whole thing with my parents. I grew up with an appreciation for like live music. And my favorite nights at Coliseum were the downstairs nights where we had bands come in and we would just jam out. Yeah. And I met some of the coolest people in the world because of that. And, um, but when that kind of dried up, you saw the music scene kind of change and it started, it stopped becoming the live music and it was more of that, um, like the EDM stuff and nothing against it. I mean, we booked Paul Oak and Fold at, at Roxy one year. And it was one of the coolest things ever. That's like one of the greatest DJs in the world at the time, but he was like an OG. Then you started to see a lot of these other, you know, up and coming DJs come around. And then what ended up happening was therapy closed. So all of those kids that were doing the therapy scene, which was like the after hours, the rave scene, yes. they needed a place to go. Yeah. So therapy was like, uh, like when the bars close, you go to this place and if you wanted to get into some trouble and find certain things, you could probably go there and get it. And people would stay there till what? I mean, uh, till the sun comes up, basically. Till this, so I was, I've never went to therapy. Well, th there was one thing that could get me to go to the therapy. Again, it was probably a girl. Yeah. So probably about a handful of times I would go. And it was usually like, oh, we're all going. Come on. We just work. And it's going to be really, there's a really good DJ coming. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll go. Yeah. And then. <laughs> You leave and it's like, it was like the hangover when they wake up and they're like, oh my <laughs> Why God. did I do Because that? it's now, the sun is blazing and it's mad at you. And you <laughs> are just getting beaten up <clears throat> left and right, you know, like a vamp, like the Lost Boys with them, like put yeah. my, my shades on and get me some greasy spoon breakfast, 
right now. So this was back when Jersey Shore started really taking off. Oh, Jesus. Talk about how that changed the kind of structure of nightlife and like, you know, did you start seeing a lot of Pauly D's pop up? Well, we grew up with the original. Of course. Pauly, Pauly was Shout out to Pauly. Out. Shout Pauly out to Pauly. 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 He's such a nice kid, too. Every time I've ever dealt with Pauly, even back in the day when he was just the, the handsome kid in the corner with the hair. He was he would hang out. He was a red room staple back in those days. And he always had a gorgeous chick on his arm. He was never a problem. He was just nice yeah, he was a quiet kid. That's it. Yeah. So then you have the after effect. So and this is funny. I didn't realize there were two Pauly D's. The DJ OG OG, OG yeah, yeah, yeah. Pauly D, yep. who was one of the greatest, nicest kids in the world. I've worked with him a hundred times, him and DJ joint. They are like family. So when they told me that Pauly D was going to be on a TV show at MTV, I'm like, Pauly's <laughs> going to be on a TV. And it was the biggest goof in the world. And they're, oh, oh, they're talking about little Paul, oh, other Pauly, with the, the kid with the hair. Mm-hmm. Oh, Pauly D hasn't had hair since the day he came out of the mother's womb. <laughs> but um, that was the one thing I, I regret from that time frame. They popularized the shitty behavior. Yeah. Mm. Like somebody coming up and thinking it was cool to sucker punch somebody. Like you saw a lot of that. So did you see you a think MTV is the one that popularized that? Because yeah. That, they, yeah. You, you shined a light on, on stupid behavior. And yeah. People right. are going to emulate it to think they're cool. Um, you saw a whole lot of braided bead rosary companies yep. kind oh, of yeah. spring up. Oh, yeah. You know, um, Aquanet hair products kind of went through the roof. And the... Uh, a lot a of gold frame, chains, a lot, lot of, of gold chains, a lot of V-necks. Yeah, yeah. Um, wife beaters. That show, deal. that show was so big. I, I mean, thinking about it now, I haven't thought about that show in so long. But man, when that came out, it was so. It, it just it was phenomenal. like a bomb dropped, and everybody. Um, I remember just like there's there wasn't a person that I knew that didn't watch that show. I didn't watch it. I was in New Hampshire. I saw it every once in a while. I remember a very short girl with black hair, long black hair. She was always like drunk and falling over, but in Poly D, but only that's all I knew of that whole entire show. So a lot of the country missed out on that. Yeah. <laughs> it gave an identity to people that didn't have an identity. They could like, easily latch on to this mm-hmm. and become like, yeah. oh, like a Poly D. Like, like, they could wear that, the costume. That's so cur- You just nailed it. You yeah. just nailed it. No. Oh. Yeah, that, because because there was a lot of people like that that were kind of balancing through like their identity. Yeah, and and they just you know they're like okay now I can just be a fuck boy really. The coolest <laughs> thing in the world you can be is original, and unfortunately, um, people didn't read that book. Yeah, back in the uh, that that early two thousand tens or whenever I think that came around had to have been right around the same time, because we saw that surge while I was at Coliseum. I, I'll never forget it because one weekend everybody looked like a Mike the situation, a Ronnie, a Vinny, or a Paul. But for them, for them, it was like for Paulie, nobody was doing that before Paulie. That was him. He that is that was him. Authentic. That was Paulie. Uh, so he created that. Culture. He created that shit, dude. But he didn't... look at our children now, um, because of TikTok and everybody's a copycat of somebody that yeah. they see on social media. And that's what's crazy to think that it actually only started in around two, 2010 where this culture of just being unoriginal became huge. Yeah. I think that if you don't have the influences in life to kind of, I mean, you know, listen, I, I grew up with the things that I grew up with and I'm sure that that made me, you know, the, the, the things that I hold dear in my life and in my mentality, I picked them up from somewhere cause I thought they were cool, Yep. but you can't just copy and paste one of that right. and just it right. It right on top of yourself. It's just too unauthentic and people are going to catch on to that. And in those days, I th- the original question was, who did I see that really, um, th- they were the guys that were in that scene, but they saw through the bullshit and they realized, you know what? I'm not going to spend $300 on a $50 bottle of booze. Um, but you know what I'm going to do? I'll, I'm just going to lay in the cut. I'm going to be smart. I'm going to get up and go to work the next day. I'll be the most fun guy in the room, but I'm working in the, in the morning. You don't call out. That was a mentality that if you had that, those are the guys that are today in 2024 
I'm seeing thriving. Yeah. I'm seeing those guys starting their own companies. Shout out to John Hawkins. That's one of the one of the dudes I used to see out all the time, and the he's killing it right now. Saint yeah. of Hardwoods. I won't say another person's name in Hardwoods in the same Yeah, me neither. me neither. Jay Hawkins is he's a Smithfield kid. Yeah. He's, he's a good guy. No, he he turned that company up, man. He uh I'm super proud of what that kid did. <sighs> That's it. Yeah. And you know what? To get a name like that out there, because you know what? He started, he was a bouncer. He, he did security and a bunch of different things. But at the end of the day, you know, he's pushing around that machine. And God bless him. He's got the arms to prove it. That mm -hmm. kid is, is he could give Hulk Hogan a run for his money. Yep. Right? That's yep. that mentality, though. Yeah. Get up and do it. Get up and work. Like, I, I, I had the, the benefit. I lived with Mike Furia for a while who started City Life Providence. He was an offshoot of what Ed was doing at the time. You know, he Ed gave everybody the roadmap. Yeah. Like, this is what you do. Yeah. And if you, <clears throat> it doesn't take much. And the, one of the coolest things ever, Ed ever told me was push positivity. Like, yeah. I, you know, I was a, a, a bouncer into jujitsu kickboxing and I grew up wrestling. You know, I was tough, and, but I'm, I'm not the world's tallest guy. I tap out at 5'10 if I'm really lying a little bit. <laughs> but, you know, that was it. You have a little bit of personality and, and push and root for the underdog and, and give the people the chance. If, you know, you give them the chance and it blows up in your face. Okay. Now I know never to go there again. Yeah. But. You so, got to, you got to give them a chance. Oh, you, you know, and, and you shout out the couple of guys, that, you know, three of us put it up, put our first little promo crew together. We were in the biz entertainment, right? You know, and right now one of those guys is, has a successful capital fence in, in Rhode Island. Mike Rizzo, he's puts up the best uh, PVC fencing and all gigantic. That was stuff. He was, he was my VIP manager. Yeah. He taught me how to sell tables. Yeah. You know, and now as we're a bunch of us are moving forward, you know, another guy, you know, ended up starting um, a security company, you know, ended up being like the go-to company for booking bouncers. Like, okay, if the, the bar doesn't need to pay all the liability, everything else. You just kind of uh, outsource that to an outside company that carries the insurance and they worry about getting accounts and staffing them and having the right people in place. Okay. There's a, a market for that. And are these the kids that were not really worried about spending the $300 bottles? And were these the kids that were kind of, these were the guys that knew how the sausage, was they knew made. how, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. And that's it. Like, you know, my father doesn't probably love this, but I worked in a strip club when I was very, very, very young in college at PC. And I, I say now, you know, you learn how the sausage is made. You'll know never to buy a sausage. Again. <laughs> and that was a mentality that you kind of learn like, oh, no, no, the, the exotic dancer doesn't love you. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and yep. unfortunately, the guy that's dated a few exotic dancers in my day, I had to learn that the hard way. <laughs> But these, learn. Are, these are lessons. Yeah. And they're not all good right out the gun. So you're in the nightclub, you're in the nightlife scene. You decided to make a switch. You, you, you changed up, you changed gears mm -hmm. and you started getting into real estate. Yeah. What was the timing? What, what happened there? My model girlfriend, after getting her degree in social work, topping out at $45,000 a year, said that she couldn't date somebody that worked in a nightclub. And I said, oh, interesting. Okay. And it got to the point where I had a late start. I was in my early 30s, and it is was something that I always wanted to do. My father had beat it into my head all my life. Like, you know, you need to get a real estate license. You know, you have what it takes. You can do this. And I think it was at that point a regret that he had. He didn't get into it. He didn't do it. And one of the greatest accomplishments I will ever, ever, ever hold is the fact that I got a real estate license and I was able to get my dad into real estate. Wow. You know what? Awesome. Man. A couple of years ago, he, he beat me. Yeah. Aww. He got, he, he sold a $3 million house on block Island because he picked up the phone and it was a Zillow lead and he, and he ended up set, closing wow. it. I've done a lot. I probably sold North of a hundred transactions in my career but I haven't had a $3 million cash deal on block Island. Wow. Well, that's my dad though. My dad is the coolest and there are no flies on Mike Canole. Yeah. He just, you know, he ran bars and nightclubs and he, he saw the, he, he saw the road, the path and he tried to beat it into my head. Like kid, you, you need to 
you know, straighten your act up a little bit. And I bucked, I bucked, I, I don't buck anything my father tells me anymore because you need to learn. Because you from, realize that all of it was right. And you know what? <laughs> and he, la- he laughs. I'm like, because I tell him all the time now, I'm like, you know, you've never been wrong, right? Like once. <laughs> <laughs> ever he we must have, love that this oh, he must love that dude but you know what he never rubs my face in it he yeah. just smirks saying oh you should listen to me yeah but oh, um, i can't wait oh oh and you have to come to it you have to you know that fight the system mentality you um eventually the world will kick you enough times yeah. you'll learn to to block <laughs> True. so what's the real estate What's the current landscape of the real estate game right now? Right now, it's so this has been a funny kind of the last maybe three or four months. I mean, we just came off of an election. Everybody's holding off until then. What I'm seeing, though, is people are putting the pieces together right now. And um, I have a funny, funny, funny feeling that right now, get your fine. If you if you have any inkling at all get your ducks in a row right now maybe this isn't the most opportune time for rates but i'm gonna be honest my parents bought a house in the 80s the the rates were in the teens anything historically under six percent has always been taught to me is is prime Mm -hmm. that that's you know all systems go we were lucky it was a gift free money two percent interest rates for the last few years when the rates were in that that ballpark but now it's sticker shock to everybody and i i battle sticker shock by one very 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 important rule look at what you can afford to buy right now if you can buy it if you can write that check without your hand you know gaining some sort of uh rheumatoid arthritis (laughs) and cramping up when you write your check every month that's where you need to be and if you can't afford it don't buy it that's that's rule number one. Never put somebody in a house or a property or income generating that they can't afford. They're going to regret because then they don't become a raving fan. They do not recommend you to anybody and everybody. And I, I am so blessed that my entire real estate career in the over the last maybe four or five years, it's all sphere of influence. Mm. I don't have a billboard on ninety five. Where I'm, you know, I had my shirt off, and I'm trying to. That's not it. I, you know, I, I bless the guys that do it. It's not going to get. I'm not going to spend that kind of money to get the ROI. You know, I, I, I will say this. You know, shout out Nathan Clark. Nathan Clark was one of my real estate mentors very early on, and he's got his billboards up there, but he's also got more transactions over the last ten years than anybody combined. So I have a funny feeling that he knows what he's doing. And my first few years when I was in that office and in that environment, it's a completely different world than another real estate company. You need to, you learn how to build a better mousetrap and why it works. And you spend half of the time in real estate, you know, listening to people complain about, you know, the, the new way of things are doing mm-hmm. new way of doing things. You're right. Right. And, um, okay. Are you going to be a leader, a follower? Or are you going to get the hell out of the way? And, People don't do things the same way they did in 1986. Mm. I look back at that movie, American Beauty. Remember that movie? Yeah. I will sell this house. I will sell this house. When she's got lipstick on her teeth and gigantic Cheryl hair. (laughs) That's not going to get your house sold. You need to be able to be relatable and speak to your people. And I, I always, 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 always wanted to be your friend in real estate. I didn't want to be the guy with the $5,000 Rolex driving some sort of $4,000 car payment a month, you know, f- faking the flex. I saw enough of that in the real estate business. I mean, in the nightclub scene, you know, the guys that were built on nothing and it was all smoke and mirrors and like that, they were gone because the market turns in. You're not going to be able to. They couldn't sustain that lifestyle that they were trying oh to gosh. pretend to have. For what though? Listen, I I have never worn a real diamond in my. I had earrings since I was in seventh grade. I'll never put a real diamond in my earrings. Yeah. Why? Nobody's who, gonna. Who am I, who's gonna, that impressive? Yeah, yeah. Chicks dig me. I I do just fine. I've got a great chick on my shoulder right now. She doesn't care. So why am I gonna go? You know, I, I wear an Apple Watch. I've got a couple of really nice watches, but I never wear them. Yeah. Because want to know why? Because this one beeps when I'm trying to do 17 million things and I'm uh, my GPS on 
when I take a turn, it beeps. Mm -hmm. It's easy for me. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm at the gym, I can do this and change the thing in my, what I'm wearing. They're awesome. That's usually what I'm wearing too. Oh, you know what? A couple of occasions I'll do that, but the show, the fluff, I'm the regular guy, realtor. I'm going to show up in jeans. I am going to give you a thousand percent. And you know what's going to happen? You're going to be happy. Do you think that this, the market for real estate agents is saturated right now? There's there's a calling. There's a calling that's happening because if you didn't learn how to negotiate a buyer side transaction agreement, um, you're not going to last because there are agents that are right there before they used to have to pay you in MLS with an NAR lawsuit that we were alluding to. They don't to have to anymore. You can, they can give you nothing. Oh, I didn't know that. That's what that I was about. I learned that from your mother. She sat down Did at that the recently table. just happen? Yeah. 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 Is that why she's freaking out? Yeah, but she she was she sat me down at the table. She's like, "Can you can we go over this? This just happened. I need to practice how to say this to my my client so that they understand how important it is for me to get paid even three percent." Dude, like, I would she, love so. for you. Sorry to cut you off. No, I would love for you to talk to her. It would be my pleasure. Yeah, because that was what you know. Again, shouting out Nathan, he taught us that. He knew that that was happening on the West Coast three or four years before it was going to happen. Wow. And the transact, all the trends, they come West to East, whether it was Ed Brady with Nightlife, whether it was Nathan Clark telling us that it was going to be um, the buyer representation stuff. This was all in the works. And if you just know what you can find out the, the, the skinny on any subject now by looking into it, like yeah. the fact that we have every tool in the world at our disposal to teach us anything that we want to know it, it, we are in a in a overabundance of information and the people that don't just learn how to pull the free stuff out of the air and use it you're crazy yeah you're not using chat gpt shame on you shame Absolutely. on you man you got, five times ten times a day ten times a day ever the, the business plan and, and, and it gets me organized something that would have taken me a week mm -hmm. takes me 35 seconds it's amazing and learning how to talk to it I always say thank you, though. Yeah, yeah. God forbid it gets all Skynet on us. I want them to know. Or can you please? Yeah. Can you please? please? I say that Our a lot. Alexa has a little bit of an attitude Yeah, she now, does. So a bitch. It's, oh, it's Alexa's happening. Alexa's got some sass. She <laughs> does. <laughs> that. All right. I. This is a, a, a nickel's worth of free advice for anybody. Learn how to use Skillshare. Learn how to use Masterclass. Yes. We're probably paying for how many uh, VOD streaming services hey cut two of them that you don't use anymore paramount plus i think i i, I finished watching uh mayor of kingstown tulsa king tulsa king i think solid shows yeah um i think there's not a whole lot more i really want to see so mayor probably, of kingstown we gotta remember that oh yeah. mayor of kingstown is, is it good oh jeremy what is renner it about? jeremy renner is a, oh i love jeremy renner. oh he's this love is, him this is it's he's better than hawkeye in this one he um him and his brothers run a consulting agency in a Michigan um, prison town. It's like a prison industrial complex Oh, I love town. it already. And he's the guy. Their, their job is to get shit done between the outside world and the inside world and the politics Ooh. and the prison guards. And it is just gritty as hell. That sounds it is, good. It is like Renner at a 10. And it's just, it's solid all around. You've got such a great supporting cast in that one. Um, the kid that played Littlefinger on Game of Thrones, I, I always forget his name. He's in it. He plays like a Russian mob dude. He's sadistic. It's excellent. Mayor of Kingstown. All right, let's do this. We're we got to get out of here in about twenty minutes. So I want to I want to do a segment that we've never done before because it just uh, came yeah. to my head, and we're just gonna do it. Go for it. <laughs> <clears throat> top top ten favorite movies. You want to do top five? Do top five. Let's I'll, do top I'll, five. I'll give you uh, this is I prepare this. I've been waiting my entire life for something. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> so, <clears throat> no particular order. Best movie. Uh, I mean, the top of my list. Let's go with five first. Down oh, we'll do to five. One. We'll do five. Um, uh, I'll go one. I'll go back. Top one. Uh, actually, let me see what I can do. Because no particular order, but there is a. I'll save the last one for first. Yeah. Or uh, the first one for last. Perfect. Um, one of the greatest movies of all time, The Power of One. Uh, Stephen Dorth Morgan Freeman. Um, Apartheid South Africa. This kid gets orphaned and he has to live in a concentration camp for the South uh, concentration camp with uh, the South Africans that are enslaved. Right now he gets befriended by Morgan Freeman, who teaches him how to box. Mm. Now, 
little known movie. I saw it a thousand times as a kid. It is one of the most powerful movies I've ever seen. That's on the list. Great title. We've got, oh, it's legit. That is that is worth anybody watching. Um, one Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jack mm. Nicholson. I saw the, some of that. I've never seen the whole thing. I am such a Jack Nicholson super fan. And, um, and the actor, my favorite actor of all time is directly influenced by Jack Nicholson as well. I'm going to save that for the for the number one because he's a star in my first number one movie. But just that that movie, it's just it's it's a classic for a reason. Um, what else is on there? I mean, Lost Boys is my my cheesy 80s horror movie, you know, MTV rock and roll. That's a that's just a movie on another level. Um, let's see. I mean, you have if you're a dude and you're growing up when I grew up Gladiator. Yeah, yeah Gladiator. 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 What about any of the Batmans? That one. The, with the Joker, Heath Ledger. I think I would have to put that in my top five. I love the, uh, see, great movies. I think that that's a genre, but I, would, I, would I put it at, at the top of my list? Performance-wise? Performance-wise. amazing, wise. like what that kid did. Okay, here's, here's the challenge. Go watch 10 Things I Hate About You. Oh, and then it. go watch the Joker Batman and um, like the Dark Knight. And- mind boggle the fact that that's the same he was thing. able to transform into yeah, yeah like he, he went into another place there and you know like those those just like monumental performances yeah like you you can't really touch that and i see why it's regarded as such a great film and then you see like i i, I superhero movies are a soft topic. i just thought the cinematography like i thought everything about that movie was just on point. what about the, the greatest thing of all time it was an improv when he's dressed up as the the nurse, yeah, dude, and he's, he's like clicking bang, the button, he's banging, it's not, and, yeah. then, and then it, and it wasn't even supposed to happen. Oh, it was the, that, and then you find out oh, he didn't mean to do that. He yeah. just improv that yep. or that first, like the, to me, the best part of that movie. Oh, there's a few, but that opening scene where they're all clowns and they're doing the bank heist. Oh my, I'm supposed to shoot the driver. Yeah, dude. Oh, yeah, goodness dude. gracious, the pencil, the pencil scene. Yeah. Oh, it's it's it. That whole movie was incredible. So you got three. You got two left. Oh, let me see here. Comedy wise, I got to throw a comedy on there too. Um, Caddyshack. Yeah, yeah. Caddyshack. Amazing. Rodney Dangerfield. Such a good movie. Such a good movie. That, that those were as a kid. We had. We didn't. <laughs> what were you born? You were born in what? Eighty January 83? of eighty two. Eighty two. I'm like the OGest of millennials because we were the class of two thousand. So they beat us into, you know, beat it into our heads that we can do anything if you want, if you worked hard. And then yeah. we got there and we found out it was full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, but also the year that the whole world was supposed to shut down in 2000, all the computers were supposed to go bust. They're making a movie about Y2K. It's a yeah, movie. Well, I, I just saw the, the trailer the other night. Yeah. We saw Heretic with Hugh Grant and a very interesting movie. But um, that the Y2K thing is that was the trailer and it looked like a great 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 film but it's got that selena uh what's her name oh, no the, uh, the beetlejuice girl not the beetlejuice girl the snow white chick snow white chick oh, the uh, one that oh, here we go right here what's her name Rachel's. rachel zegler oh yeah oh this poor girl is they need she needs a better pr team because every time she opens her mouth everyone hates her really oh. it's unfortunate she's a beautiful girl she's such a talented singer y2k but, when does this come out it's got a December 6th. Uh, that looks very, very, very funny. Yeah. So, oh, it's a comedy? Yep. And Fred Durst is in it. So how can it oh, be Oh, hell yeah. Cool. <laughs> wow. But, all right. Um, one more. What do you got? Best, best movie best of all time. Best movie of all time. I'm going to lead up to it by saying it's probably, it was the first screenplay ever written by Quentin Tarantino. Oh. And it was not directed by Quentin Tarantino. Pulp Fiction? Not Pulp Fiction. True Romance. Oh, I've never oh, seen that seen one. seen that. Required reading, brother required reading true romance is the story of a regular schmo and a and a call girl from florida and they meet his boss where he works at a comic book store his boss buys him a date for his birthday because he knows he's, he's a loner and nobody likes him she ends up falling in love with him and they find a suitcase full of cocaine <laughs> oh, and it is a cross this. this is one of the greatest films of all time it has got the greatest cast you want. Wait, is Samuel L. Jackson in it? For a split second. He's the one that finds the cocaine? 
or he's something to do with the cocaine in the beginning. Yes, I do remember that movie. That's a good movie. So yeah, it's yeah. got the greatest scene of all. Time. Ash, what's the cast of that movie? True Romance. Uh, uh, let's see. Tarantino's dialogue is on point. Look at who's in this movie. Val Christian Kilmer, Slater. Brad oh, wow. Pitt. I forgot about Val. The Kilmer. ghost, Val Kilmer, the ghost, the ghost of Michael Rappaport, Christopher. Oh, wow, I, look at you this know cast. What? This is the best cast of all time. I see Gary this. Oldman as Drexel Spivey. Wow. Is today White wow. Boy Day? Wow. Nah, today ain't White Boy Day. That <laughs> is, it is such a it, like. It just keep going on. Every, James Gandolfini, Jeez. James Gandolfini and Patricia Arquette, one of the best fight scenes in movie history. Bar Tom none. Sizemore. Yup. Oh, I, what I a could, cast. This is a verbatim movie. I could I could go back and forth with it, but so many amazing scenes. It is. It's gritty. It is just. It's. 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 Detroit. It is so. Oh, it's so. What What year was that made? You 93, think? 93. 93. It was. And because of this, he was able to make movies like Reservoir Dogs. Oh, be, and then and then that was it. This so was the good. first screenplay that he ever put so on. So good. But yeah, man, that's that's incredible. That is the Mount Rushmore of. Uh, that is the top of the, the mountaintop right there. All right, let's do movie. let's do one more. Let's do top three video games of all time. Oh my god. <laughs> Video, cool. be- um, all right. Mario Brothers, obviously. <laughs> I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna. I'm gonna trump that, and I'm gonna say, Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time. We were just talking about it with Ash. Zelda. He knew. Oh, he, knew he already pulled it up, dude. <laughs> we, we had the conversation <laughs> oh, earlier. That was. That's a move. That's a game that I have just spent so much time. Just you know that. No, that game was incredible. Oh. That game was incredible. Look at my home, the tree. The, I actually, the great deco I tree. actually beat that game. That's the only game I think I've ever beat. It, it was, it, I'll tell you, my buddies and I, we were in high school, probably sophomore year. We would all, like 10 of us were all playing it. And we would all go home. And this like, was oh. Game Boy days, wasn't it? This was N64. But they had it on Game Boy? This was, they ended up doing a bunch of little, like, sub games off of it. But this was all in that time frame. It was incredible. That you have to throw out Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter. I'm gonna put them. In I the loved street. Mortal Kombat. Yeah, oh, definitely. that was you know we still. Like, were you a Tekken guy or? I never. I didn't have a PlayStation. Oh, okay. We were a little poor, so I yeah. only had one video game, <laughs> and um, and we ended up. I I was I got an Xbox early, which is probably my third favorite game. It was an Xbox exclusive at the time, but uh, I'm I'm an OG Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah. That was, was the most game, legit. Dude. I think that was the first game where you could fly something. <sighs> Remember flying that ship? That was like the first game where you could and you fly could, something. And you had like those little cutscenes where you like. Yeah, 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 exactly. It was, but like you can pick that. This was, was cool. You could pick if you wanted to be good or bad, yep. light or dark. And yep. it actually changed yep. the end of the story. That was way amazing the at the time. Yeah. So those were probably, you know, I, I've. I look for games that I'll go back and replay again. Yeah. I've replayed Ocarina of Time a couple of times. I've replayed Knights of the Old Republic. And you you just drop me in front of any Mortal Kombat ever. And I, my cousins hate me because <laughs> they can't touch yeah, me. Yeah. And I'm not good, but I grew up, you know, we went to Cranston East. And we would play video games with the most hardcore video game playing kids of all time. We would go to the arcade at, um, at Warwick Mall. Uh, I can't remember that. It was, wasn't Dream Machine. That was the one. In, that was in uh, that was in, that was that was in Lincoln. Lincoln Mall. Yeah, yeah. That's the, the one um, I used to I go to. Whatever the hell the name of Either way, in DG's Arcade. But you just line up and, okay, you know, I just got the game informer. I know how to do a fatality. I'm yeah, like, remember that had shit, to, dude? You oh, had to man. win before you could oh, put. Oh, man. Oh, and then, you know, I had little brothers growing up. So when we could get, you know, we mowed the lawn enough times or whatever the hell we had to do to make 60 bucks. <laughs> yeah. And we would get the Sega game and we just bang around Sega. on that. That's awesome. That's but awesome. Yeah, we, we had a good time, man. Let's do, uh, let's pull out some current events really quick. We'll do Got a it. quick, quick couple, uh, current events and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this thing up. All right, let's take a quick commercial break to bring you our sponsor, Burns Roofing. I've been personal friends with Eric for over 20 years. He's an incredible stand up businessman. And if you ever need anything um, regarding roofing in Rhode Island and Massachusetts, give them a call. 
They do honest, hard work, and he is my go-to whenever I need anything in roofing needs. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Pro Landscaping, Rhode Island's trusted partner in creating beautiful, functional outdoor spaces. From detailed lawn care to full-scale landscape design and hardscape installations, they bring expertise and a commitment to excellence to every project. If you're looking to elevate your property with skilled, reliable professionals, Pro Landscaping is here to make it happen. Denzel Black Panther 3? That's not real. You better calm down. What? <laughs> It's Denzel I, I, announces that he will be in Black Panther 3. All in on that. Love Denzel. Yeah, Denzel's he's, the man. He, that's Book why. of Eli, the Book of Eli. Oh, my God. That's incredible. What a twist. Great in, twist. Incredible. Yeah, uh, Training Day. I mean, d yeah. You know what movie he's really good in that we saw the other night was the movie The Bank Robbery, uh, where you ever seen that? What, what the heck was Something heist. Um, um, I think, oh, what was where, that? Where, where they dressed up as... They they made everybody dress up the same, and then at the end, then it was in like a, they let everybody go, a and they negotiator could, or so, I forget something what it like was. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He went through. I mean, it's on HBO right now. Ricochet. You want old Denzel as a cop in a gritty movie? John Lithgow is your your character, your your foil, your antith, your your bad guy. Yeah. And you go down the rabbit hole of John Lithgow as a bad guy. You want creepy? You got that. And then you've got a movie called Raising Cane. Oh, I saw Raising, yeah, Raising Cane. Yeah. And yeah. he's got like he's got yeah. like multiple personality disorder. So we're gonna call it because I can't say disassociate. I disassociate. can't say the word. Disassociation. Disassociate. He can't associate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> it's like multiple. He that's great. Like if you like things like Split with James McAvoy, that was like the OG. Split was good. Split I didn't was see really that. Good. Oh, that was a solid. Movie. We just saw the the spinoff. Like there was like three spinoffs that they did from that, but. Um, yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's do. What do you think of? I mean, obviously, we just had probably one of the biggest elections of all time happen. Um, I think that you know, Marco this, Rubio, Secretary of State. Yeah, he just appointed him today. I would have liked to see Vivek in that role. To yeah, be me very too. Honest. I wonder what he's going to do with him. Um, you know what? I think that that guy going into other countries and, and negotiating on behalf of the United States would have been a solid, solid move. Marco Rubio is definitely, I'm a total political nerd. My grandfather used to run for office when I was a kid. So I've been around the political machine all my life. Very, very political family. I have polarizing family on both sides of the spectrum. I kind of land in some weird uh, common sense version of the middle. Mm. And um, right now... I, I would have liked to see what that that looked like. I'm yeah. very curious to see what these cabinet picks end up being. What about Tulsi Gabbard? What do you think she's going to do? Tulsi Gabbard just I love her, officially dude. went to, uh, to Team a, Red the other yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that was one of those, I say this a lot. We grew up in New England, Irish Catholic. We were Kennedy Democrats all my life. And um, I like to... I, I had a, a very, very, I have a very influential and very well-read history teacher for an uncle. And he looked at me once and he, he's like, listen, what's JFK's most famous speech? Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. If you took that line today, what would you say would be the political party that was behind that? Because mm -hmm. it sure as shit wasn't the blue team. And that's where I think that you lose a lot of the goalposts you, when, when they get moved that far in the other direction where you, you're thinking about in the time of crisis where we're about to get bombed during the Cuban Missile thing. And this is the, the messaging that's being put forth. You know, you, 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 we've lost so many great people. And what would the world look like if if the Kennedys weren't assassinated, if Martin Luther Martin King, Luther King yeah. Kennedy's judge, not a man by the color of his skin, but the content of his character. Like he'd be crucified today yeah. for saying that. Richard Pryor made a made a joke um, on stage. Do you remember that? I where he, where he came out as God. I think he came out as God. He was like acting as Jesus or God, and he goes, uh, he goes, we need to start spreading positivity and blah blah. blah. And uh, what about Martin Luther King? Wait, you killed him? <laughs> All right, well terrible. let's go let's go ask Kennedy. Wait, you Wait. killed him too? Yeah. And he, I forget the whole bit, but it was like, it was just, it hit home. And then he walks yeah. off stage and it's, uh, it was very powerful, man. Those, I mean, that's the, the true art for, you know, you know, when you lost me, 
I'm gonna tell you, when you started to go after comedians, yeah, I grew up in a yeah. in a comedy friendly household. Shout out to Corey Brailsford and uh, the the crew over at Comedy Connection because that guy has been good to me. We used to work together years ago when we were both at Cox Communications, and he's grown that business out. He's they're opening up the Columbus Theater in Providence again. I'm so pumped to see what comes out of that. But when you take away the comedians, when you stifle the free speech, the ability to to for our two guys. And for a group of people to sit and be able to just talk like normal human beings, we lost that ability. Yeah, man. Like I think the, it's coming back a little bit. It's got to, because that's the backbone of what our founding fathers. Do you watch Kill Tony? Freedom of speech. Love Kill Tony. Oh god, we yeah, watch kill, every Monday every night. We watch Monday, Kill Tony. Faithful. It's a it's a ritual that we've had since we've met. We were that's laughing solid. so yeah. hard last oh, night. Oh, last night's like, episode was that awesome. Laughs together. Yeah. It's yeah, amazing. It's, it's amazing. It's an epic bond. Yeah. Love it. Look at the people that have defected from one side to the other. They're, you know, okay. You, oh, dude, you, big you names. Lost Rogan. Yeah, oh, you lost, yeah. Rogan, Rogan was a Democrat. When he announced that he was he was endorsing Trump, like that. The I world mean, stopped for a second. How about you don't do his podcast? And that, and what you you think that maybe that's a head scratcher? Yeah. It's just you look at it from if this was a, a football game and that was your playbook, like who's who and not for nothing, a billion dollars raised and twenty million dollars in debt by the end of it. And a lot of money went to Beyonce, a lot of money went to Oprah, a lot of money went to Taylor friggin' Swift, a lot of good dads. Megan the Stallion, $50 yeah. million. Dollars. But then Trump said, Don't worry about it. Yeah, I got I'll pay you. That off. What a flex. <laughs> what a flex. I'll, what a flex I'll cover your debt. Uh, Just I love get it. on out. That's such a Trump move, too. You know what yeah. I want to see? I want I want two strong parties in this country. I really do. Yeah, me too. And I think that we need to, the, you know, if you're a complete lunatic I'm on, on some of these social issues, that I'm just like, listen. I'm a pretty easy going dude, but there are some, when you, when you lose me, I, and I, I say this in my personal life. Um, if, if you can't get along with me, there's something wrong with you Yeah, <laughs> because I, I will give everybody the chance when you were in the, the nightlife scene, you got to take on all comers. You know, I, I worked with two proud gay owners in the, at the Coliseum and you know what you learned really quickly. We're all people. We're all humans. And, you know, absolutely. I used to say we just go down a different aisle when you go to Amazing Superstore. That's it. <laughs> but aside from that, like, yeah. okay. You Listen, know. Th there needs to be two parties. There needs to be Democrats. There needs to be Republicans. They both need to be strong parties that represent this country in the most in the strongest way possible. But the way that the Democratic side was moving lately, I just couldn't get down with. We no. just need. I we couldn't need get down with, and again. I think a lot of people were in that same boat. They could not agree with some. And listen, there needs to be separate policies. And that's you what this country to. is built on. You gotta. You get. You know what? Plan A, Plan B, but they're both sane and make sense. Yes. yes. You know, I, I'm sorry, but I I grew up with a security mindset. You need to have a strong board. Yeah. I'm sorry. What yeah. are you? What are you? Yeah. You know. I mean, and yeah. the fact that on day one, I'll never forget this. You sign a, th you rip up all the Trump era policies, remain in Mexico, things like that, that were working. And then on day one, you rip them up and then you have upwards of 20 million. No one can say the same number twice, yeah. but it's a lot of people. And you know what? I have friends that are in Aurora, Colorado right now. And guess what? Yeah, that whole situation with the apartment buildings getting taken over by Venezuelan gangs. Yeah, that's a thing. And yeah. then it spread other places. But we were told that it was fake. No, the I know it was real. Not only that, I mean, being a veteran of Afghanistan and being over there, getting to know the local nationals, um, when Biden X that, it felt like all of the, the oh lives that we lost there, the American lives that were lost, the Afghani lives that were lost, all of the years of trying to teach them, because if you don't have a country that more than 50% wants change, they're never going to change. Mm -hmm. And we were getting there. We we're close, you know, getting the people that, that wanted the change for their country. But then we pulled everybody out and then boom, all that hard work, all that money, all that those lives lost was for nothing. But not only that, he, Biden brought all of these um, Afghanistan people to America, put them in Wisconsin and Minnesota mm -hmm. for what? I mean, they're coming from it. It just wasn't the solution. Yeah. It was heartbreaking to you see. You can't assimilate but, the third world into the first world. No. And think that there's just going to, you know, it, it sounds like the silliest co uh, comedy of the like the 80s and 90s. Like, yeah, take Welfare's somebody and then it. bring them here. And then guess what? You've got chaos. You know, right. it's. 
not going to try happen. to live on welfare with your family and and survive in this. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be the first one. I grew up pretty poor. I I've alluded to it. And I lived, you know, during my my college days, we lived um, off of Truckstone Avenue in Providence. And I'm sorry, but I know that there's a ton of people, every color of the spectrum, that abuse those policies. Well, it was it was created to keep people locked into that system. And that's what's sad because you're bringing people from another country who are trying to survive in our country, which is expensive as fuck. Yeah. And not only do they not speak English, they don't know how our culture runs. It's it, I'm about to cry right now for these people because it's hard enough living in America, trying to be an American at the bottom. With 15 With, steps against you. Yeah. Oh, so it God. just, it's unreal. But also... Last night, Michael brought up that there's another, there's Republican, Democrat, and now there's the Green. The Green Party. The Green Party is- Ralph Nader Party. Yeah. No, I mean, they, they the, never yeah. they never get, was it Jill Stein? That, yep, that Jill yeah. Stein. I mean, what the is, way that it's built, you had the, the best third party candidate that's ever run was Ross Perot in the early 90s. And he had a great plan and he totally disrupted the, um, the H.W. Bush- Clinton era. And I mean, I think that was one of the, the differentiating factors. Thank you, Providence College History of Presidential <laughs> Elections. I, Bob Deasy was my professor, and I remember this because of that. That's awesome. I mean, cool. Jill Stein got more votes than RFK. Which was it, crazy, too, because RFK, yeah. he, he was saying a lot of amazing, powerful things. I'm I, glad, you know what? If, if, if you, I want to live in a country where good ideas flourish, and I don't care where they're coming from. Because if you know what, it's just like it's my, my gumbo analogy. You use the best ingredients and you make the best dish possible so everybody can eat. But, you know, you can't be so polarized and it's done on purpose. You know, why are some of these out of the box, absolutely ridiculous policies, the same things that are log jamming every piece of Congress in the Senate, the entire legislative process? is is basically being held hostage by a couple of fringe points and because of those nothing ever gets done yeah. and i mean it's been explained to me many 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 times it's like wwe as soon as they go behind the curtain they're all high-fiving cracking open about 100 yeah. 100 yeah. and you you've got a great perspective being a veteran in the military yeah. like i'm gonna ask you this tell me about wasted money oh Honestly, after my deployment to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. when I was behind the scenes and the curtains, that's when I started going down the rabbit hole of truth, of all of the American truths. And I've never been the same. Mm -hmm. So the waste of money is a real thing. We're not in these countries for war, really for those people. We're there for our own greedy reasons. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. It's an it's a very uncouth way to say, you know, I have a Geneva Convention card because I'm an American, but but really we're just high fiving each other in the back. It's not it's not cool. It's sad. I wasn't ready to sacrifice any more of the generation that's coming up behind us, their lives for bullshit. Yeah. Like we don't people aren't having babies. People aren't getting married anymore. I saw that stat the other day. Six point five out of a thousand couples end up getting married yeah it's sad so i mean at that point like you look you go down that rabbit hole too where it's like oh replacement birth rates and all this other crazy shit and then you add on to it like you know i endorsed trump because i hated trump in the beginning so did i yeah. i was the biggest anti like the douchebag yeah so did from I. the uh the apprentice is going to run how and yep. and i i i was i was a bernie write in 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 16 cuz i knew that hillary clinton wasn't my candidate and from there he earned my respect and there are people family members to this day that don't speak to me because i hold this but it wasn't like i'm just some blind follower like right. you know look what he did getting out of side of the paris accords and um nato nafta all these trade agreements where you go in and you run this like a business right we need that oh wow and then america starts running on a surplus again a budget surplus we're trillions of dollars that's gonna get passed down to our grandkids yeah mm -hmm. 
And yep. how many people do you know that aren't starting a family, aren't having kids? Because the financial instability is what's keeping them from doing it. Yeah. But that's also yeah. part of the agenda that our, our the country fear agenda. started. That fatalist, yep. They yeah. separated the family when they said women need to be feminist, independent, work. They took the children, the, the wives, the husband, separated all of us. And now our children go to school all day and then they go to day camp or they do, do something else while mom's working, while dad's working. We see each other for an hour at night and that and that's it. So it's it's been an agenda that's unfortunate that we need to get back to the basics of our country. Otherwise, we're going to lose everything that's been so beautiful about it. I, I that's probably the most. Hey, that's a thousand percent. Ten out of ten. I agree. I think that that's been the family unit has been taken away from so many Americans. I'm 42 years old. I would never get married as, as laws were written right now. I've seen too many people get devastated, especially dudes, you know, no throw. I'm not throwing shit on the good chicks that are out there. Right. But I have seen so many guys get brutalized in the divorce process. Yeah, me too. Kids that have been taken away, yep. you know, like, like people that use kids, you know, as, as, a, as a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. it's the, it's it's gross and and we wonder why kids are running around like absolute savages right we wonder why guys like johnny somali or whatever the hell his name is is running around acting like a complete douchebag in korea and now he's facing 29 26 whatever the year because of just running around and, and acting like a like an, an idiot. american <laughs> what's, what's the kid there that walks around like this with his bodyguard like the kid with the goofy he just cracked up his lambo oh uh jack uh Doherty. Jack Doherty. So, yeah, like, like the fact that that exists in this world. Yeah. Like, come on. Like, yep. if I even walked stupid in front of my father, oh, man. I would have caught. If that kid I, was my kid, I would slap the shit out of him every and, day. And you know what? Like, the fact that that kid gets to be monetized and, you know, he goes, well, working stiffs like us, you know, hey, I punch a clock. You know, I work for myself nowadays, but sometimes that's the worst boss you'll ever have because yeah. nobody's hotter on me than me. So one of the biggest opportunities and privileges I have for doing this show is I get to meet awesome people. And um, just from having this conversation with you, man, it really broke down like the person that you really are. Yes. I really appreciate meeting you the other day. You know, you had some troubles with your uh, with your building. We were able to situate it for oh, we you. We better talk about this because I can't. <laughs> I'll tell this story until the day I die. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, go ahead. I mean, we 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 uh, I'm going to tell you how, cool how we Mike, met. Uh, well, it was easy enough. Shout out to uh, to Ryan Fournier. Ryan Fournier. OK, Ryan yes, Fournier. Yes. I had I had put up a post when my grandfather died in COVID. We have a commercial property that's been in my family for years with an adjacent lot in Smithfield. And um, he handled everything. And my grandpa, my grandmother is unfortunately she's dealing with the effects of losing the love of her life over the 50, 60 years, however long they were together. And she does things the old school way. Uh, she found an HVAC company a contractor out of the bargain buyer. Shout out to the bargain buyer in <laughs> one's uh, the, this this area of the world. It's 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 I guess still in publication, but it's the free paper. <laughs> yeah. You know, you you go buy it, you pull it out of the thing. It's a bargain buyer. So she found somebody that was an unlicensed guy, and she paid him. $20,000 up front to do some mini splits in our commercial building. We've got an amazing salon right in Smithfield, Rhode Island. I style salon. Shout out to those guys. They do amazing work. I've never seen an unattractive woman come out of that place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just saying. No, they do, they Shout do, out to Cassandra. They were doing great work. It's aesthetically Bobby pleasing to be in there. Gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Oh, and like she decorated all that. That's not, yeah. funny. That's not my decorations. <laughs> but, um, you know, they had left this job half finished and would promise they would come back. And the problem was my grandmother had paid them out of pocket. And, you know, my family is out 20 grand on something that a should have cost like what, like maybe four or five, maybe. Mm -hmm. But the problem was the overall, the actual issue had nothing to do with what they were doing. And it was, a, there was no heat. And I would get a phone call every day. It was cold that the heat wasn't coming on and I'd have to go and try to fix it myself and believe me i'm like a monkey looking at a math problem like i don't know this isn't my area of expertise so what ends up happening is i go down the rabbit hole and i just try to get an hvac company to come and take a look at it you know i had i'm not going to name a name but let's say that they are very prominent in the plumbing and hvac world in rhode island come out and they wanted to charge me eight grand 
to do something that was not what was going to fix my situation. I had another guy come out. It was going to be 10 grand. He was kind of working on, you know, that type of uh, same thing that you guys come out because I, I'm at my wits end that somebody, I actually had another guy that was going to set to do the job for the 10 K. I'm like, we're just going to have to pay this because I can't deal with these phone calls every morning for another year. Cause it had gone on for two years. And no matter what, I couldn't get somebody out. No, everybody had an excuse. So I had a guy come out. Oh, said everything that we needed to hear. I was going to bite the bullet and, and, and pay and have it taken care of because I wanted my tenants happy. And on the other side of that coin, three weeks go by and it's crickets. And I'm like, I'm calling. I, I'm getting nothing. Finally, I'm like, well, for whatever reason, you know, I, I had booked him through a, a GC that I know. And he was always, oh, he's, he's been in the hospital. He, he's doing this and this. Well, it would have been nice to know about this because in the meantime, my tenant's pissed. And, and you can't have women in a salon freezing. They're washing their hair. They're doing all this. They're going to get sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I put it out there into the sort of, believe me, I'm like, I'm like king of asking for help on social media. Um, it's a secret to my success. <laughs> and, you know, Ryan had been a guy that had never, ever, ever let me down on anything. And he, he dropped your name. You guys came out the next day. I put a call in. You answered me immediately. And right then and there, that was, okay, somebody actually works like I work. <laughs> so if you, get, you see me any time in life, I've got my phone out. I'm going, you know, it drives anybody I'm with crazy. But the amount of business that comes back and forth through my phone, connecting pieces, connecting dots, that's what life is. And I put myself there so I don't complain about it. It's how I, I operate. Yep. And the fact that, oh, what? This, this dude's sitting on his phone too, waiting for, <laughs> and, and, and all of a sudden it was like driving. Every, I'm like, okay, I can be out there tomorrow. I'm like, holy shit, I might have to rearrange my because I got somebody coming out tomorrow. And you guys came in and did your thing. And not for nothing, it was a breath of fresh air. And as we're walking around and not for nothing, all that beef footage that you took while we were there that day, I loved it. Yeah. Thanks. I'm like, oh, they get it. They, they understand this. I go, Geez, if they're half as good as just what, what I'm, I'm going to be okay. <laughs> and within a couple of days, it was fixed. And it was the actual problem that was diagnosed and that I had been, everybody else had missed this one thing. And it was the simplest of the simple of the simple. And and, and it was fixed within 48 hours. Less, I know it was less than a week. And you guys charged me like, well, like two grand? Yes. Okay. With a drywall. And with the drywall. They, these, this hacker had left a giant hole in the side of my building where the heat was just getting sucked out <laughs> of it. And now I, I got to tell you, they're thrilled. They're happy. I can't say your guys name enough times from what uh, you give me a microphone, a bullhorn, a mountain top. I don't care what it is. <laughs> That's awesome. Horizon man. is forever. My HVAC solution yeah. and anything else that I can ever do to help you guys out because I want, you know, be the change you want to see in the world. That's what it is. If you see somebody that is going to do the work, they're going to come through for you. My business, everything that I have to do, it's results oriented. Mm -hmm. You could find another agent. I mean, why would you? I'm the greatest. But <laughs> you could find somebody that's going to do it. And they're, they're, anybody can do the job. Are they going to do it right? Are they going to deliver that like, holy shit performance? Like I want, I, I am like, I have the inner mentality of Simon Cowell was sitting there watching some kid that's just a complete goober <laughs> singing his life out. And I love that moment where I can just be like, you know what? You just might win this entire thing. That is so rare because everybody else will just do what it takes to get done. Mm -hmm. But, and, and now, you know, I, I team build yeah. and I see, you know, right now the, the focus is, not just real estate, because I have to diversify myself. So I'm looking to build teams for other different businesses that could work together. And the one thing that I've learned in all of these crazy scenarios, I could talk for a month straight without stopping, is if you don't have the right person in place to get the job done, you're not going to get it done right. Don't stick somebody behind the desk for eight hours a day. That would rather rip their skin off then do that. I'm mm -hmm. that guy. Mm -hmm. I have an ADHD case 101. Mm -hmm. and you give me a bunch of stuff to do. I'll go do it. Don't put me in a cage. I can't do that. Yeah. I will go out and I will move a mountain for you. Yeah. But all you got to do, but just I'll do it. I'll figure out the best way and I'll get the other guy. I'll burn 
some of my resources to get together guys 10,000 hours of mastery. Yeah. And then, you know what? I can't learn how to do X, Y, Z, A, B, C. There are only so many hours in the day. But if you can take the ego out of it, self-assess, what am I good at? What am I shit at? And the things where I am weak, I need to make myself you need to grow. Strong. You need to get better. That's it. Yeah. And, and that if you boil it down, that is the secret to any success. You got to be honest with yourself. Where do I suck? How do I get unsucky? Work on this. If I can't do it, I'll find somebody else that can. That was, I learned that. Neil Strauss. Neil Strauss is one of my favorite authors of all time. Uh, Rolling Stone author that ended up doing a bunch of editorial books that he wrote. He wrote The Game. He wrote Emergency. Yeah, The Game's good. The Game was, I mean, it's required reading. And you can correlate any single one of those tactics into business, into everyday communication. Learn how to get good at social dynamics. It turned an absolute nerd into a nightclub promoter, an MC, uh, a, a real estate professional, uh, an aspiring entrepreneur, uh, a, a business consultant. And just because I learned that I needed to get good at things, I can't go around saying I'm the great at, every, at everything. There were some things you don't want me doing your paperwork. Yeah. You just don't. You don't want me doing your schedule. You don't no. want me doing any of that. No, Trust you me. Don't. I, I know. Yeah. But you know what I do? I now have the greatest associate in the world. Shout out to Carissa is, you know, friend of mine since we were we grew up in the same neighborhood together an aspiring real estate agent that has a kid at home wants to sit there and, and you know loves to sit in front of a computer and do paperwork because she could spend her days with her son it's the most beautiful thing i've ever seen in the world and you know what you make me look like i'm a freaking genius okay i've got you know the the best lending partners in the world the best legal the best tax people in the world now because I am not the guy that's going to sit there and look at that. You want me to go do the big thing. Like you want me to come in and make the, and, and stand on front of the stage and talk for an hour into a microphone. Okay. I got you. What yeah. do you need? I won't stop talking. Yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's great, man. But I appreciate the kind words. You dude, you came into my, my situation and you, you should have an S on your chest as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, you got thank a W, you, you got the double W's, but thank you. I want to thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you for, you know, just inviting me. I'm so impressed and everybody needs to come out and, uh, and, and use horizon and just meet you guys and just, I'm telling you, I wish you nothing but the best. Thank you, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I think we connected at a really good time. I was in a meeting today where like, it just so happened that you were on the phone with a, a partner of a partner and he comes in the room and he's like, I'm on the phone with Brendan right now. And I'm like, he's, I'm literally going to see him in about, <laughs> in, <laughs> in about an hour. And he goes, yeah, I'm the guy that he introduced you to the other day. Like, so I don't believe in, um, you know, coincidence, you know, it, this is happening for a reason. Why? We don't know yet, but I can promise you that I think within, within the next six months to a year, we're going to find out exactly why we met. Yes. Let's go. Let's pull up let's his go. socials, Ash. Uh, let's pull up your Instagram. Your uh, so Look at that stud. Guys, go check out Brendan <laughs> Canole. If you guys are looking for a house, if you guys are looking for property, if you guys are looking for any advice, go check out Brendan. He is an absolute stud in this business, as you guys already know um, by hearing his story. He has the passion. He has the knowledge. Um, go check them out. Um, and, uh, just tell give a quick, give a quick two minute breakdown on what you do, how you can help somebody that's in the market right now. Um, the first thing I do is I demystify the process. Um, I, I learned, explain it to me like I'm five. Okay. I'll explain it to, I meet my people where they are because you could have a, an MBA in business, or you could have a fifth grade education. I'm going to help you. And I'm going to get the, you the information, the, the stuff that you need to make the rest decision. It's not my, I, I, I take all the personal out of it. You tell me what you want to accomplish. I build you the roadmap to get there. Mm. And that's all it needs to, it needs to be. I saw you make a post the other day. You said you would be surprised at how many people think that they're so far away from actually being eligible to buy when they're really this close. Yeah. So, and, and I, all hats off to my lending partners. I've, I've basically lucked into the fact that I, I walk into a room and I'm like, I am going to give you as much of my business as possible. You just need to be able to handle it. And you need to actually uh, just deal with the fact that you got to have me to deal with. And, and you, it might not be the, the sexiest file in the world, 
but I'm going to bring you somebody that's ready, willing, and able to buy a house. Let's get the knots untied for them. Or, you know, one of the, my passion is small businesses, people that are underutilized where they are. They need that thing. You know, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not somebody that's ever going to have a boss ever again in my life. Yeah. And it was just, I need to connect to those people. I want to connect. I, what are you good at? What in, you know, one of the things that we're developing is like, how do you find the side hustle, the gig in this economy that you are going to thrive in? How could you be making money doing something that you love so you don't experience that burnout? Mm -hmm. uh, There's one of my favorite TV shows, Letter Kenny. Mm -hmm. Do what you love. You'll never work a day in your life. That's that's one of my favorite quotes in the world, man. My grandfather told me that when I was very young, and I took that very serious. See? This is great minds, man. Great minds. <sighs> Brennan Canole, thank you for coming on the podcast, man. It's been thank an absolute you, pl pleasure. And I'm super looking forward to um, to working with you because I know, I know that we're going to get something done. I love it. And, I, you know, shout out to all the cool people that helped me get into this chair right now. You know, if I didn't say hi or just give you a thank, you know that I'm thinking of you because I can't be me unless people poured into me. So it's all about finding the, the right people that, that will uh, see the value in you and you just you run with it. You get an opportunity, you know, Eminem said it, you get one shot, yeah, man. one moment, you yep. gotta run. Yep. So, thanks guys. You're a good dude, it. man. Thank, Thank you very you. much for coming on. That was awesome. Excellent.